Hello everyone, we will talk a bit about Stalingrad propaganda again. And here is the host Bismarck from Military Aviation History who hosts this Q&A for my supporters on Patreon and subscribers, basically. All right, so I'll ask the question and then I'll be quiet. Um, I have heard that, this is from Mafia by the way, I have heard that for propaganda, Paulus VI army being destroyed at Stalingrad was sold to the public as a heroic sacrifice to buy time for von Kleist and Manstein et al. to escape a trap to the south in the Crimea, and he was portrayed as a hero. Googling has led me nowhere. Are there any existing monuments or statues or memorials to the hero Paulus still around today? I don't know why, but I would love to see that. So first off, a little bit of correction, sorry. I think you mean Caucasus and also not Manstein because he was not trapped. Actually, Manstein, his 11th army was upgraded, on the quotation marks, <laughs> into army group Dawn that should have, uh, should perform, or to a certain degree, try to perform the relief attempt. And it was assigned uh, certain um, units. Now, I did a video on Stalin propaganda already, but I don't recall this part in particular. Yes, it would make sense since the 6th Army indeed bound a lot of Soviet, un uh, Soviet units and also secured the flank of the Army Group A in the Caucasus. And as pointed out by Kierig, who wrote one monumental book or a little bit older one, on, on, on Stalingrad, Paulus was involved in the planning of the operation earlier, so in the summer operation Case Blue. As such, he was aware of the importance of covering the flanks of the operation the Caucasus. To quote, after the failure of the relief attempt in December 1942, Operation Winterstorm, however, the main goal for Paulus, according to his memoirs, careful here, was to gain time for the reconstruction of the Southern Front and the rescue of the armies in the Caucasus by holding out in the encirclement. This attitude deserves uh, all the more serious consideration since Paulus in winter 1941-42, as Chief Quartermaster 1 in the General Staff of the Army, had been decisively involved in the planning of operations for the year 1942 and knew exactly how important the, the security of the flank on the Danube and the Volga was for the force on the, on the, on the Okay, now about the, his the issue with Hero Paulus. This is a bit complicated in many ways. Mm -hmm. So first off, Hitler promoted Paulus to General Feldmarschall, Field Marshal. And as far as I remember, he added a little note with the promotion. Namely that no German Field Marshal was ever captured alive. So basically he hinted him to commit suicide before they get to you. Um, Paulus, I think, he didn't really appreciate that from what I know. And then the problem was in, in, in captivity, um, Paulus joined the National Com Committee for a Free Germany. There was a preload organization of, I think, Officers for Germany or something, which was a German anti-Nazi organization in the Soviet Union. As such, he has been seen as a traitor. Furthermore, he was one of the key witnesses of the, at the Nuremberg trials against German generals. Of course, I don't know how immediately he was portrayed. It could be that immediately he was portrayed as a hero, but later on this likely changed. Mm -hmm. Then actually after the war, the Soviets wanted to trial Paulus himself. And this was initiated in 1949, but Stalin himself made sure that the trial didn't happen. Needless to say, um, Paulus later settled in eastern Germany, so that was more or less occupied by the Soviets, which was all, yeah, on sort of occupation. Um, in this sense, all his memoirs have a bit of a different tone and context than most of the other German generals' memoirs, which were usually written in the western Germany and also focused on the other side of the Cold War as well. So, from what I know, it was less Paulus than the defenders, under quotation marks of Stalingrad, because the Germans actually in their propaganda sh called the 6th Army and parts of the 4th Panzer Army that were in circuit Stalingrad at that point, the Verteidiger von Stalingrad, the defenders, mm -hmm. which 
in a simple military sense to a certain degree makes sense, but actually is a bit wrong because Stalingrad is deep in the Soviet Union, so defending it as a German uh, makes little sense unless there's an alien invasion going on. Um, so one more interesting issue, which I think I also mentioned in my video about Shining Rock propaganda was that the policy was that the whole sixth army perished. So everyone. This also meant that any letters from POWs, German POWs in Soviet hands were intercepted and destroyed. This was policy. Although there was at least one letter from a general that got through and that was passed then around. But yeah. So Paulus as a hero, maybe early on, but I assume later on that they just switch to the faceless defenders of Stalingrad. Yeah. And because they were also aware that, that Paulus was captured. And I think I think Paulus at one point was even should have been chief of the general staff at some point, was planned. So Hitler was extremely furious in, in many ways about this. And yeah, so the original question was. So yeah, I mean, monument at no no point at all because it, it was too fast going on. Basically, once they were destroyed, I don't think there was anything planned at all. I don't think today we would have any sort of memorials yeah, to any no. sort of generals from that specific time frame. I might be wrong. Yeah, I don't even know if the Germans built any monuments in Second World War to the generals at all. I know they had like planned the Stalingrad shield, yeah. like, um, and I think even Paul suggested the, the grain elevator to put up there. Um, but yeah, that's actually a good point. German general, there was, I mean, there was the Hindenburg Memorial. I mean, there are some uh, army barracks that are named after certain people that also served as high-ranking officers, maybe not generals, but officers during the Second World War, that they then became generals during in the new Bundeswehr, at least in West Germany, um, that were named as such. But there are no statues. Yeah, I think the Hindenburg, I think there was this, this huge, which is now in Poland, I think Hindenburg Memorial, which was huge. And I think... Tannenberg. Yeah, yeah Tannenberg, the Tannenberg. And I think what... I think it was more common. They had like two or three more or less sacred sites where yeah. they where they put their channels in but i don't think that <clears throat> that statues like like you have from 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 old generals yeah. like from centuries ago it's quite common you have statues of those but but even i think from the first war but are there any statues of i mean there are a lot of bismarck statues i know yes. that there was a bismarck cult so you have like all over germany the bismarck statues but actually from World War One or World War Two generals, and I don't know if the Germans. I mean, you see always like these m mega buildings that that Hitler planned or something, but I, I think it was more always like a f more faceless mass. Well, there's uh, there's a lot of memorials dedicated sort of to the fallen of World War Two yeah. general fallen, but. There's never anything... That, that's interesting, because yeah. for instance, for the Soviets, you know, there are always Stalin and Lenin statues yeah. all over the place, but do you know of any Hitler statues? No, but I ha haven't really gone out trying to find them either. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, I mean in, during, in his... during, I mean, he, he was in charge for 12 years, yeah. so... There is, I mean, the, the, the bust, the, his head was quite common. Yeah, the, 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 the bust is quite common, but... but, but but this was more or less private. Yeah. So th this is more or less now for me an interesting question because I know of the Soviets, but I don't know when they built all the stat the Stalin and Lenin statues because it could have been that they started building them. But I mean, Stalin they well, didn't build them after. If Stalin's there are dead. no Hitler statues from that time frame, there would also not, not be any generals. Yeah, this is the thing I'm going, yeah. and, and and this is the question with with the Soviets and yeah. and how they did this because it's actually quite interesting that. Because it's, I think, a bit in the, uh, counterintuitive. Yeah. Because you have Hitler and it's, it's, it's his person, the Führer. Mm. Whereas with the Soviets, it's actually less, at least from the ideology, 
it's less of a leader cult, whereas, whereas Nazi ideology clearly focuses on the leader cult. So, but the leader is not, the, the swords put them all in status, whereas the Nazis don't. Which is actually like the other way around. It would say if you read it. And again, if it's a leader cult, the leader would be omnipotent essentially and omnipresent everywhere yeah. in photographs and busts and yeah. in the news. So you don't really need a statue. Well, but, you could say, um, but, yeah. but why put the Soviets them, put them up all, all the places? Because they're heroes of the Soviet I mean, Union. Here, here, this could be the thing. I'm not, I actually, I'm not sure, I think I read something about this, but it could be that the statues for Stalin and Lenin were not necessarily put up by themselves, but more or less people after, that feared the them. Yeah. And this way it would make more sense, especially with the, with the Stalinistic purchase and everything. Mm. So more or less that they were, were an indirect tribute to I'm loyal to you. But were the Lenin and the statues, uh, Stalin statues built while they were alive or afterwards? I mean, Stalin fell in disgrace rather soon after he died. There was the Khrushchev, Khrushchev thing. Yeah. So, and with Lenin... But Stalin came kind of back with Brezhnev, I think, more or less. That could also be the case. I'm not, I'm not that good on the Cold War yet. That could also be the case that they're all rather old. Or not or rather yeah. new. So yeah, as you, as you <laughs> can see, we, we, we kind of I mean, went off track. Yeah, but if, if the statues, generally speaking, like you have, for example, in Britain, if you sort of go to St. Clement Church in London, you have uh, Harris, you have Dowding. We don't have that in Germany. Uh, if you go at Whitehall, you have Monty, uh, more or less opposite of it. You don't have that in Germany. I mean, there's also an aspect similar to that, I think, with... I had a talk with one Australian once and he noted, I think he had some, some lectures at, he was an officer or ex-officer, and he noted like the different approaches to war from the Germans and I think the British, and he noted that the Germans do more, focus more on the, on the systems aspects, whereas the British are more on the, the personal aspects. Mm. And if this could also turn into here a bit because I mean, I'm also, I'm a systems guy, as I said in another video, I'm not a people's person. And, and if you look, for instance, at the Rommel, I think the British published probably way more and the Americans about the Rommel than the, the Germans at all. And, and something, and we look more on a system side, whereas I think the others look more on a personal or sometimes unit history side. Yeah. Even if unit histories or something, German view of war is more like, you have systems, functions, and everything, whereas the others look more on a personal and historical and individual aspect. This will also, to a certain degree, the whole thing with the statues, I think, yeah. approach as well. I mean, the amount of books that were, if you look at just the RAF, that were written about just one bomber crew going on one mission, highlighting you know, the history of all seven guys, or six guys, whatever, um, what happened, how, how they survived captivity and so on. That's a very sort of personal story. You have a lot of these books. If you go into a museum and a bookstore, you will find them. So I don't think we have that sort of for that, Germany. That even feels odd for me that you mention something like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, it's, it makes for interesting reading if you just want to know a little bit about the lives of these people. But yeah. then again, after the fact, how much do you actually know? So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For me, I mean, also coming from from computer science aspect, for me, it's all about the general aspects of something, mm -hmm. and the individual stuff can be sometimes used to see if it um, supports the argument or goes against it or not. But I'm more on the general understanding. So yeah. Anyway, I think we've, we've been through this question. Yeah, right? I think <laughs> I think I hope we answered the question properly. So thank you very yeah. much, Bismarck. Thank you, Andrew, as well for making us think about this. A little bit more than we expected. I, I think it was Matthew. Was it Matthew? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Matthew, Matthew. Apologies, Matthew. Um, no worries. But thank you for supporting Bernhard as well. And so, see you next time. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for watching. And see you next time. Bye.